The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Love news, but find keeping up a bit overwhelming? Well, Newsable is the answer. It's your daily fix of everything worth talking about. I'm your host, Imogen Wells, and in about 15 minutes, I'll bring you what you need to know from Aotearoa and around the world and explain why it matters. Newsable tackles the big stuff without taking itself too seriously. Listen and follow wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to Business is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business is Boring is brought to you by Spark Lab, offering inspiration and practical advice to help businesses find their edge. To hear more about Spark Lab, including details about the latest events, workshops, and business tools, visit sparklab.co.nz. And now, here's your host, Simon Pound. You're listening to Business Is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business Is Boring is made by The Spin-Off with help from Callaghan Innovation, New Zealand's innovation agency. Here's your host, Simon Pound. A couple of decades ago, there was a big lingerie industry here in New Zealand. But in 2010, Bendon made the call to pull the last of their New Zealand operations out, and the design jobs left New Zealand. This moment left the head of design and a past Bendon CEO wondering if there might be a way to make a different kind of bra company, designed here and based more on fit than trends, where they could match affordability with comfort. These weren't the first time that these kind of thoughts were had in the industry, but when these people went for affordable, they meant it. Bras, as most listeners will know, can be bewilderingly expensive, but their first big customer was the warehouse, where they sold for something like 25 bucks. Since the start, they've expanded to retail, international sales, and have sold something in the region of a million bras. To talk the journey, turning a lost job into a multi-million dollar opportunity, and what's next, Rosen Thorne, co-founder and managing director, Sue Dunmore joins me now. G'day, thanks Good so morning. much for coming along. Kia ora. Hey, so first up, um, paint us a bit of a picture, because we've spent so long in New Zealand being about how everything's been declining in the industry. It's hard for some people to realise we actually had a, a thriving big lingerie and manufacturing industry and Bend On, where you were uh, design director, was a huge force. It was. There were factories around most of the Upper North Island um, with quite a large workforce. At the time, a lot of the raw materials were also made in New Zealand. Um, So to have raw materials and the workforce making them in New Zealand, it was very profitable to be New Zealand made. Things changed, unfortunately. And lots of the raw materials started being made offshore as uh, fabrics changed and technologies changed. And unfortunately, New Zealand didn't keep up with it. And it's quite, I mean, for for such a um, a staple kind of uh, piece of clothing, uh, there are a lot of steps and a lot of very specialised kind of machinery and materials involved, aren't there? And, and yeah, what, what goes into making a bra? It is. It's actually a feat of engineering rather than your standard clothing. There are, are or can be well over 40 um, specific different pieces to make a bra. And the construction is actually more like making a bridge than it is making a T-shirt because you have to understand three-dimensional technology, forces and weights because let's be fair, at the end of the day, some of the boobs are very big and they're very heavy and they need to be held up by what can appear to be very light fabrics. So structural engineering is more of a bra than a T-shirt. And then also specialist materials for those same things as well because you know things under pressure for a long time but also needing to be comfortable. 
Exactly. Um, it would be terribly easy to make a bra out of something like Kevlar. It's going to do the job for you, but it would not be comfortable and no one would want to wear it. At the end of the day, it's an intimate piece of apparel and women want to look nice and they want to look pretty and they want to be comfortable. So today's technology for the raw materials that can be made to look extremely light, but are extremely durable, um, the combination of that and then being able to make them look attractive as well and do the job of holding up what needs holding up. Um, those are all the forces that have to come together to make a bra extremely comfortable and good looking. It's very easy to make an uncomfortable bra. <laughs> it's not so easy to make a very comfortable one. And how did you get into doing design and running things there? Um, originally, my design degree is in three dimensional design so that makes sense um, I then after leaving university went and worked for Marks and Spencer in the UK um, and because I think my degree was in 3D and I thought in three dimensions um, it became the easiest move was to put me into the bra department of which I then stayed and it's one of these things that if you actually enjoy it you kind of stay there for life um, I left the UK, sailed around the world with my sister, landed up in New Zealand and just said, yep, this is where I want to be. Um, joined Fairform in New Zealand at the time and then was headhunted by Bendon and remained with Bendon for about 15 years. Yeah, well, it must have been like um, the sirens call to New Zealand for a, for a bra <laughs> guru, this tiny little country with these these great big, because it wasn't just binned on. There were a number of really big companies in the lingerie industry here. There were, there were. I mean, Fairform was probably one of the forerunners of it, um, particularly in st- structural design. Um, but bend on was the big monster, the big beast. And then so although, you know, so, so the world changed, the materials were being made overseas and the, the machinery got more and more kind of complex and we didn't keep investing here. What happened? Like, t- did they physically actually just kind of pack up all of the factories and send everything away? Absolutely. There was, um, because I also Bend On was owned by a much larger group. So obviously the pressure on numbers and the pressures on cost effectiveness became very apparent. At the same time, you had a lot of big companies overseas shifting their operations to China and other countries where the labour costs were cheaper. But it isn't just about the labour costs. The raw materials were actually being made there as well. So Bendon had to look at itself and say, well, if we wanted to survive as a company, what are we going to have to do? And the call was made move manufacturing offshore, it was no longer profitable in New Zealand to be importing raw materials and New Zealand workforce. So one by one, the factories were closed down and the machinery literally was packed up and shipped to China and sold to the factories in China that um, Bendon was then working with. And so now today, you can't, for love nor money, make a, a, a kind of large-scale production piece of lingerie. Oh, no. Look, if if I had Nirvana, I'd have a secret little room <laughs> with one of the, each of those machines that was so fabulous in there and be doing stuff. But no, no, not at all. Um, you know, even my sample room at Bendon when um, it, it took design to Australia was shut down. Those machines were sold off. And I heartily wished I could have laid my hands or had the foresight to have laid my hands on a group of those machines because I couldn't even get an old sample machinist of ours to make me a sample properly and efficiently um, when when we first started Rose and Thorns. They're just not there. And and isn't that remarkable? So there was all this kind of um, experience, uh, skill. Like you say, it's it's three-dimensional chess in terms of like the design, but also the make as well. Uh, And then all of these machinists, although the machines got shipped away, they just, I guess, had to move into other areas of work. But you and a small kernel of people who'd been in the design and leadership, and you'd been making things like... um, El-, El McPherson Intimates and stuff. Hey, like really, yep. really big international brands for Bend On. What, what was it that you then thought, like, oh, bugger this, we can still do it? Like, what, what happened then? <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm not sure if it was quite that much of an oh. epiphany. <laughs> it was more like, oh, right. <laughs> I, I think you went through the process of, well, if I'm going to be in the indus- stay in the industry, then I need to move overseas because the job's at the sort of level that I was doing, we're all overseas. And then I just went, yeah, we didn't move to New Zealand 
to live in France. We moved to New Zealand to live in New Zealand. So better get my A into G and start thinking about what it is we could do. And um, my partner in crime, my ex-CEO, Stefan Preston and myself had been chatting and we just went, hey, we can do this, we can, but we can do it with a different tack. Um, I had been put out in the back paddock, so to speak, for six months and told not to do anything, not to talk to anybody. You can sit there. Um, and that gave me an opportunity to not talk to people in industry, but talk to real women about what they were doing with their bras and their needs and things like that. And so often they were saying to me, oh, yeah, you know, that was... That was a really pretty bra. It was really nice, but oh, it really dug in here or it was really uncomfortable there. And I started saying, well, why didn't you tell me at the time? Oh, well, you know, we didn't want to. And I'm not sure that I would have necessarily listened to the level I was listening to when I wasn't in the, in, you know, in the industry, so to speak. Um, and I started thinking, well, there's this sort of, there's this pattern that keeps occurring. Sure, they're pretty, but they're not comfortable or they're comfortable, but they're butt ugly. Or they are just really expensive. And now that, let's say, I'm on one salary because I've just had a child, I can't afford them. The kids come first. I'm last in the food chain. Um, so it was these reoccurring things that kept coming up. And it was, first and foremost, comfort, affordability, and just make me look good. Don't make it comfortable and I look like a nana, because even nanas don't want to look like nanas. <laughs> and, and that cost thing, I mean, um, the, the the pattern of industry is they say, oh, well, we're going to move overseas because it's cheaper to produce. But then the prices to the consumer stay pretty similar. The company just has a whole lot more margin and is able to do more. And I suppose if you're not going to have manufacturing as part of it, if it's going to be um, affordable, you may as well pass it on to the yeah. consumer. Well, we are not, um, we're not a mammoth company. We're very tiny and we're lean and mean. And yeah, we do think about the primary focus for us is making sure that the women that we are serving get the three tenths of what we want, the comfort, the affordability, and the looking good. And affordability is high on their priority list. And yeah, like so, you launched with you know after after a year of research or something with the warehouse <laughs> and all kind of a hundred odd of their stores as your customer, which is an enormous kind of zero to one hundred move, and with a twenty five dollar bra. And how much? And, and you know, amongst some other price points, how much would that same bra have been in the old way of your doing it uh, if you were trying to do that? <laughs> what, in bend on days? Yeah, yeah, mean? yeah. Or, oh. or just in the old way, yeah. Yeah, it would have been up at $60 plus. Yeah. yeah definitely. So half half the half the price. Yeah. Wow. And so what did you have to kind of like change or learn to be able to do that? Um, I don't know. I don't know necessarily if it's change or learn. Um, a lot, A lot of what we were trying to do by recognising that women were not wearing the correct size of bra. So the, the, the global stats are 60 plus percent of women still don't wear the right size bra. And we did, um, we do a survey every year and the women tell us about what they're doing. And it can, can, sorry constantly comes up that they hate going for a bra fitting. So they wear the bra the size they thought they were. So that gave us a problem in itself because they are not wearing the right size. So what could we do with technology to create um, a bra that would make them feel more comfortable even if they weren't wearing the correct size? So we did a lot of work with raw materials to get that. And that is the basis for our constant um, ability to keep prices within check. We are using a base fabric that we have created through all our products. So there is a constant. We are able to pre-position that raw material so it allows us to have it always there. So we're not changing laces, changing raw materials on a whim, which get to be very, very expensive. We have five basic shapes within our business. Each one of those shapes specifically does something for a woman. Um, and once she knows her shape and her size, then she can buy that bra constantly and know it's going to fit. So the parameters around all of that means that we have fixed costs, so to speak, with the raw materials, um, and we know where we can price things. 
and by standardizing your work, Absolutely. you can get better, better and, cost and more cost efficient. Yeah, and be- be- better over time, which is the the absolutely bananas <laughs> thing about fashion in general is it's like okay, it's a new season, yep. let's do everything different: and new that's... fabrics, new trims, new processes, new suppliers, and and you can't forecast future growth because you go out and you say to your buyers, "Hey, here's a completely new set of things." There's yep. a couple of familiar things, but mainly all new. And that is exactly what I was doing for 15 years at Bend on with Seven Brands. Every season it was new. Every season it was like, oh, we have to change this. We have to do this. We have to do that. And you're like this hamster on a wheel that just gets faster and faster and faster and faster until suddenly you implode. And at the same time that every cost in the world is going up, <laughs> you, you can't standardise to no. go down. Yeah, wow. So that, that's a, you know, it's such a huge thing to change. How Were you surprised at the... Um, at the demand out there and the ability to go from, you know, in a in an industry where people are saying, oh, we've got to leave and everything's got to be standardised, that you were able to immediately pick up such a big customer as the warehouse, where kind of one in four New Zealanders in a week walk in there. It's amazing. Well, we'd worked with them. Oh, I'd worked with them really for the past 15 plus years. So I knew what working with the warehouse was like. Also, for manufacturing, you had parameters around it that you had to make 3,000 units of a style colour to put it down a, a manufacturing line. So the first thing we knew was we needed a big customer. And w- working with the warehouse at the time fitted in exactly with our philosophy of wanting to talk to the average New Zealand woman. So I was not talking necessarily to the Stella McCartney woman that would want to pay $100 plus for her bra. I was talking to that woman that was saying to me, hey, I've now got two kids. I can't afford to be paying $60 for a bra. Can you not make something that I can afford? And that was the woman that was walking through the warehouse stores once a week every week and so for me to be able to get into the 93 stores that took us literally from Kaitaia to Bluff I could talk to every New Zealand woman and that that was what we wanted to do so yeah it was it was a very whoop whoop moment. (laughs) And, And from that first kind of six six months to a year of development where you landed those five styles and what they were doing how much has that changed over the years with the market feedback of of being across New Zealand and and yeah, has it changed when you've gone overseas as well? Um, no, what's been amazing is that our five shapes have stood up. So all all our hard work, thank goodness, is proving to be correct. Um, the five shapes have stood up and we are just constantly now superficially recreating them because the base block patterns, we took the time in the beginning to get those right. So it means we can extend the size range. Yeah, sure, there's a more technical work to expand the size range, but essentially the base patterns are exactly the same and our raw materials haven't changed. And when you say extend the size range, is that to get to, um, you, you know, uh, larger sizes and smaller sizes uh, where, where there's probably a very small number of people who are in those areas, but they will have needs. Absolutely. And we've just done some test case runs, um, taking our size range up to J-Cups. Um, and we tested that GHJ, because that's a different construction method, with very small numbers, thanks to our manufacturer, who's just been amazing allowing us to do that. And they have sold out. And we've gone back for more. And they have sold out. So we are proving that, yes, they are a small, small earn number of people, but to be able to give them something that's comfortable and is pretty, um, they are, they're not getting, and at a price, they're not getting that elsewhere. So, yeah, I'm hoping that they will stick with us and, you know, we've got ourselves a nice little group of ladies that we're making happy. How, how have you gone internationally? Um, Online is our biggest um, part of our business for the international push. We have um, been selling in Australia to companies like Autograph and Rivers, but really online is our main method of talking to a much broader breadth of uh, women overseas. How do you do that? Um, We've got a fabulous website and we've got an amazing woman who works for us (laughs) who runs all that. I stay well clear of it because if I push buttons on things, I break things. (laughs) But um, Sam is doing a fabulous job with that and we are just pushing it and developing it all the time. Um, We work through, we've got amazingly 47,000 
women on Facebook that follow us constantly um, and let us know when we're doing things right and let us know when we're doing things wrong. Um, and I know that Toby works really hard with um, Google and um, AdWords and things like that. And just it's feeling our way through. Look, we are not going for this massive international launch. We would rather walk before we can run um, and do things properly and just eat our way through it bit by bit. This focus that you had on kind of comfort and also uh, providing um, in, in things that are attractive to people and also uh, affordability, surely those are things that the industry's been trying to do. Why, why do you think it is that there was still this gap in this room for you to be able to come in there and, and have something that's really customer-centric? You'd think so, wouldn't you? Yeah, wouldn't <laughs> you the, you'd think industry would focus on that. Yeah. Um, I think it's become more of... Um, an attractive proposition within the last five plus years. Um, I'm not sure that it was necessary that much of a focus previously. As I said, within the bend on days, we were answerable to a much bigger board and their focus was on numbers. And, and were, the, were they a bunch of blokes? I mean, the world hasn't had they a great were. the world hasn't had a great history of listening to women, has it? They were all blokes. <laughs> They absolutely were blokes. Every single one of them on the board was a bloke. <laughs> and, and they were telling you what, what, what kind of yeah. fashions and what kind of things to do with yeah. women's underwear. Yeah, uh, yeah. When they were all wearing their black suits and white shirts and black ties. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was all looking at the bottom line and, you know, what's happening there. So it was about delivering on that bottom line constantly. And like I said, running seven brands and being a hamster on a wheel you're constantly working in three dimensions and even four dimensions because you're working on the season that's about to drop into the store. Is that Has it come out of manufacturing correct? Is it looking right? You're working on the season that you're selling into store. Are the samples looking right? You're working on the season that you're starting to develop. What's happening with the color palettes? And you're working on the season even before that. So you're two years out. By the time that bra hits the market, you've got like, Oh, I've known it for two years now. It's really boring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and you're backwards looking too because, like, well, what's been selling? Yeah. So we've got to make sure that that's happening too. It's, yes. a, it's a quite ridiculous industry. So it, <laughs> it is. And you get a planner saying, oh, you can't make a pink bra because three years ago a pink bra didn't sell. And you look at them and just think, what world are you living in? <laughs> And, and what is that going direct to customers allowed you to do? So looking at kind of the way that um, the retail space was set out, there's a, there's a, there was like an extraordinary kaleidoscope of colours and kind of um, yes. finishes amongst that kind of, when we say five blocks, uh, it's not, it doesn't look like there's no. only five kind of things going on. No, because we can very cleverly trick things up. Um, what, what does it mean? You can constantly make things look different even though your base is the same and that's what it's about and it's about giving women the confidence to be able to purchase the bra that they know and love but make them look a little bit different um so yeah it, it wasn't the same when you were running lots of brands and it was a constant fashion story um now it's about delivering that comfort and making her look fashionable but we are not fashion forward we are not out there putting lime green bras out there we are we are looking at what she wants to wear and how she wants to wear it when you went to set up so against this backdrop of the industry closing them literally sending the machines <laughs> away uh you, you know doom and gloom and stuff did, did people tell you that you were bananas as a small crew to decide oh we can do this yes yep Absolutely. It was like, why would you want to do that in New Zealand where there is no industry? They've gone. Why would you want to do this? And you'd have to say, well, we want to do it from a slightly different perspective. And as it's asked earlier, you know, having the, the constant conversation with women face to face now instead of being three steps removed means we can react more quickly so we can work on what they are after. So, yeah, being told we were probably clinically insane was a daily occurrence for a while. <laughs> you start believing it, but then you come out the other side. <laughs> when, when did it start to feel like it was um, was was a good idea? Because you, you were also employee owned, weren't you? So yeah, it wasn't yeah. just kind of like, oh, here's an idea. You all had a mm -hmm. lot of skin in the game mm -hmm. and um, a, a lot on the line. When did it start feeling good? I think about 2023 is about good. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm kind of waiting for it. <laughs> and I, I, I mean, and, and that's still with, with with hundred stores and big online and yeah, 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 yeah. like um, what eight years behind you and yeah. <laughs> no, it's been it's it moved for me. It pivoted about two years ago, and you could see that pivotal change when you saw the online business start to become a very serious part of our business and a great um, a great indicator that were, there were really good things to come. You know, you could start seeing the train moving in the right direction. Um, but, you know, there's still a lot more to do. There's a, a heck of a lot more to do. And as I said, we are not about to start sprinting for the end line. We are about taking it slowly and doing it correctly. Um, so there's still, there, there is still a lot more um Hurdles to overcome, I think. How important is it that the employees are in charge? For us, it's it's important. Um, we, as I said, we all put skin in the game to start with, um, and we've all invested well more than twenty four hours a day for umpteen years. Um, and it's it's nice not working for a big corporate. It's nice being able to know that you are working for a good outcome, not just for yourself, but for the people around you as well. Um, yeah, it's 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 pretty important. And although you'd run, you, you know, looking after design at, at, at you know, very big uh, lingerie um, underwear companies, what, you, you know, what advice do you have for people who, who might find themselves at a late stage in their career, like, you know, having got to the top and then starting out fresh and moving into being an entrepreneur, a co-founder, a, a managing director. Like, what, what advice would you give to people who, who have their kind of career pulled out from under them? Go for it. If, you, if, you, if you've got a good idea and you think you can do it, go for it. But surround yourself by really smart people who know what you don't know because you do not know everything <laughs> for a long way. I mean, sure, I run design teams, but there is so much I don't know. Like I said, with Sam, with the website, with Toby, with all the analytics, with Carleen doing all the um, analysis on size curves and purchases. Could I do that? Most of it? No. So surround yourself by people that do know how to do it and know how to do it well. And also tell you when you're wrong. Because there's nothing like being told when you're wrong. And how do you define success? What will what will success for Rose and Thorn be for you? Having every woman that puts one of our bras on her back on. Oh my God, this is the most comfortable thing I've ever worn. That would be, yeah, that would be my nirvana. Huh? That's so cool. Well, thank you, thank you so much for uh, for joining us. Thank you, Sorry. Sue Dunmore, the the managing director and co-founder at Rose and Thorn. Thanks for sharing your story. That's all right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tina Tiller, for producing, and thank you very much for having us along in your ears. If you have enjoyed today, please do remember to jump on and uh, give it a like or a subscribe on the old iTunes. It really helps. Thanks. You've been listening to Business is Boring, presented by Simon Pound. And brought to you by The Spin-Off and Callahan Innovation. From The Spin-Off Podcast Network, that was Business is Boring, brought to you by Spark Lab. Make sure you're following Business is Boring wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information on Spark Lab, visit sparklab.co.nz. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.